I am Kyle Daly, tech editor at Axios, and I guess we can start with introductions, right? So take it away. I'm Elizabeth Banker. I'm deputy general counsel at Internet Association. I'm Jason Albert. I am managing director for public policy at Workday. I'm Jessica Rich. I'm an independent consultant right now and uh, an attorney, and I'm probably best known as a longtime um, privacy uh, manager at the Federal Trade Commission and its, uh, its uh, director of Bureau of Consumer Protection for four years. Hey, I'm Chris Calabrese. I'm at the Center for Democracy and Technology. I am currently our interim co-CEO, which is exactly as powerful as it sounds. Um, my day job is I'm our vice president for policy. All right, thanks. So um, I guess let's get started uh, talking about what already exists in the real world, right? Because we have two laws that are um, weighing heavily on federal privacy discussions, uh, GDPR and CCPA. What do you guys think is working? You know, what might be worth borrowing? What, what, what do you, lessons do you take away from, from each of those? Kind of a big question, but... So I'll, I'll jump in to, to start. Uh, you know, GDPR has been around now for a couple of years. It builds on uh, the Data Protection Directive, which, of course, has been around since uh, 1995. And I think there's some things that work really, really well, and there are obviously some things that uh, uh, probably could use some improvement. So things that work really, really well about GDPR, it's a, a rights-based framework. It provides clear rights to data subjects. It puts clear obligations on companies. Uh, most importantly, uh, from our point of view, it doesn't rely uh, solely or even primarily on consent as a basis for processing data. We tend uh, in the U.S. to really focus a lot on consent because who doesn't want to be asked how their data is going to be used? But it turns out that ends up to optim uh, does not optimize data use because there are lots of things where uh, it might be good to have your data processed and you could cause a lot of problems if you said no because it needs to be processed because there's a contract, because there's a legal obligation – because there's sort of legitimate interest. And so having a system where consent is really more about sort of advertising direct marketing is, is, and there are other bases for processing that are designed to protect the rights of the data such is really valuable. Um, things that don't work so well uh, in the B2B context and Workday is a cloud provider of human capital management services, having to get uh, customer consent uh, for each sub-processor. It just doesn't work. We offer our one-to-many service. Like, we're not going to use one sub-processor with one customer and a different one with another. We have one code line that all of our customers run on. And so something that would just pass down the obligations without that requirement of individualized agreement uh, would be good. Another thing is, you know, despite the idea of having sort of a single regulator, it turns out that's really not that way, and there's still competition among data protection authorities for who's going to regulate, and, and that creates a little bit of uncertainty because we were really hoping to get sort of a single stop shop out of that. Uh, so those are just a couple thoughts. And maybe I'll build on that. I think um, obviously GDPR is something that uh, U.S. companies who operate in Europe are familiar with and being able to harmonize your privacy practices on a global basis is really important for companies, um, but also benefits consumers. And just to contrast GDPR with the CCPA, um, CCPA is not a comprehensive data privacy law like GDPR is. Um, and in fact, talking about CCPA is even a little bit hard because it's a moving target. Um, it did go into effect January 1, um, but there's also uh, AG regulations that we're expecting. Enforcement will start July, um, and then there's a ballot initiative in November. So um, it's kind of difficult to use it as a guide when it itself, um, I don't think, is well understood, and um, it's a moving target. I guess I could go now. Um, so I'd like to just bring it up a level and say that um, I think what's not working is it's kind of a mess now. We have uh, GDPR. We have um, multiple, well, we have one comprehensive sta state law. We have the FTC Act. We have um, sectoral laws at the federal level. And the great potential 
that we're still waiting on at the, at the federal level is to create clear rules that everybody can understand and that brings this together. No, we're not going to repeal everything else, but that that is comprehensive and brings things together. Clear rules that consumers can understand so they know what their rights are and aren't completely confused the way they are now. Clear rules that businesses can understand so they know what their obligations are. And also so that um, the next thing we need, which is stronger penalties, more resources for enforcement, that that's fair. Because if there's clear rules and people violate them, you can bring the hammer down then uh, fairly. So the most important thing is we need much, cl- much more clarity in the marketplace for consumers and for businesses. So I guess I'll just state the obvious, is, which is that none of us would be here without CCPA. And I, and I think we can all pick apart that. But I think it's driving this conversation in the United States and from CDT's point of view, it's a conversation that's about 25 years overdue. So we're glad that it's driving the conversation. Um, I also think it gives us a chance to do more than what's in the CCPA and, and maybe do it a little better. And we've already heard some of those pieces. But I think the focus on taking the burden off of the consumer and putting it on the data collector, you know, if I am collecting your data, I should have obligations requiring how I use it to use it fairly and appropriately to limit how I use it if that data is sensitive. That shouldn't be a consumer burden. And I think we're starting to really see that change over the last year or so. Certainly it comes out of some of the discussions in the GDPR, but I think if I want you to walk out of here with anything, it's this idea that data use limitations are a critical component of any law. And I think we're starting to get there. The other thing I'll lift up, which has been sort of part of the conversation, but nobody said it, so I'll say it is we also are starting to see data portability obligations, which are, I believe, critical to how we're going to handle, how essentially the economy is going to function going forward. Because data portability enables competition. It enables consumers to move, to use new services. It enables us, enables new services to be built on top of existing platforms. And when we talk about data portability, I think we're talking about some of the broader competition and platform questions that were are there also part of this conversation. So privacy is certainly going to be a central focus, and we believe very strongly at CDT in the rights-based framework for privacy. But it's also worth noting that I think if we get this right, if we build the right scaffolding, we're also going to create tremendous economic opportunities going forward for how we use data. Can I, can I just comment that I think there's been a lot of discussion over the last few years about how notice and choice isn't working and it's not the right model and it imposes too many burdens on consumers to be monitoring every company, those behind the scenes. And yet, uh, many of the uh, proposals that we've seen um, in Congress this year were still so heavily weighted towards a notice and choice scheme. And I think that was disappointing. Do you think that that, you know, is... is, uh discouraging to you in terms of thinking about, you know, arriving at, at legislation that um, at least you guys can be happy with? I don't know. I, th- I, th- I don't think so. Cause I think it's, uh, it, it's manageable. What we've seen is we've seen a variety of bills uh, and they have some commonalities and uh, that are, that are really important uh, from our perspective. Again, B2B cloud service provider. One of the things we see in all the bills is a distinction between what GDPR would call controllers and processors, those who determine how the data is used and those who they uh, retain to process data under their instructions. You know, I think that's due to a lot of great work by BSA. I think that's due to a lot of great work by the Enterprise Cloud Coalition. I think it's really important because it reflects on how the marketplace works in the B2B space. You know, it does impose obligations on people who don't have the direct relationship with the data subject. Uh, similarly, when you talk about, you know, sort of notice and choice and bases of processing, you know, we're at the beginning of a conversation. You know, a lot of the bills have consent, and it's a natural place to start. But I think as we look more and more towards these bills moving to, to become laws, we look more and more towards ensuring we have an interoperable system with GDPR because we're going to need to be able to transfer data across borders. We're going to need to have a harmonized system to enable compliance. Uh, I expect to see more and more of these other types of bases, these obligations on controllers to respect the rights of data subjects, these other bases that aren't just consent uh, to emerge. Yeah, I think we're 
Uh, I think we're seeing, you know, trends towards considering those types of approaches, even in proposals that are heavily focused on notice and consent, like the the House bipartisan staff draft um, does rely on consent as the basis for all processing of data, but allows for implied consent for specific practices. Uh, We've seen other approaches that are more similar to GDPR, like uh, Senator Carlisle in Washington, his legislation uh, looks to um, kind of set Uh, practices that are consistent with consumer expectations, and then add heightened requirements for the types of processing that adds risk. So risk assessments, more choice. Um, So I I think there are kernels um, that hopefully we can build on to take that burden off of consumers and to give them a better experience. So I I think I would agree with pretty much everything that's been said, but just to to state it very clearly, yes, it would be very disappointing if we end up sort of with a framework that is largely based on notice and consent, but I I just don't think that's going to happen. I mean, we've already heard a couple of areas, certainly uh, a risk framework done correctly moves us past just sort of mindless consent. Certainly we've already seen some of the pieces in GDPR. We've also seen, um, oh, I can't remember what we've seen. Um, we've also seen, oh, here we go, the civil rights laws. We've seen more, bringing more civil rights laws into the discussion, and those obviously are not, you're not consenting away of violations of the civil rights laws. And we've seen that, you know, brought into a variety of the bills. In some cases, it's just been saying, um, if you see a violation of civil rights laws, report it to the right agency. In other cases, it's actually been bringing some of the public accommodation laws to the online space. I mean, these are big changes. They are obvi- you're not going to consent away those rights, and I think those are important parts of the discussion that really have flourished in the last year. I just want to comment on the first party, third party, or controller or processor distinction that you raised. So like, um, like notice and choice, I don't think that distinction should be the basis for current laws, I think it's, it does a disservice to consumers whose data is being used by, and it's very related to notice and choice. The concept behind that is that you have the relationship with one company, you give consent for that company to use your data, and then that company needs to monitor downstream use, et cetera. That hasn't worked, and all of the downstream use can do just as much harm to consumers or even more than the, um, than the first party, um, in fact, more most of the time, because then you really don't know about it. So I do think when we're talking about clearer rules, that means rules that apply equally to the, quote, first party and third party, because under CCPA, for example, and I do agree that CCPA brought us all here, um, under CCPA, you know, once you consent, the data is just out there, it can propagated all over the place, and you got no rights as to it. And that, that in today's economy, with all the data sharing that goes on, is not a good outcome for consumers. And I would say businesses, too, when you talk about equal playing fields. So, so I would agree partially with you, and I would disagree partially with you. I think when a first party collects data and then hands it over to a third party, that the third party is going to use that data for its own purposes, you're absolutely right. There need to be obligations related to that transfer. That third party needs to have direct obligations to the consumer. That's what, in GDPR terms, again, would be a controller-to-controller transfer, where a company hires another company to process data under its direction. Uh, you know, in our case, you know, we're do a lot of human capital management, and so it's you know, process employee data to provide all the sorts of services from everything from, you know, being able to enter your vacation time to being able to get paid and things like that. That's something that should be under the direction of the employer, the, in this case, the controller, who, you know, fulfills obligations, who monitors the processor, make sure the processor is complying with the instructions, who has a contract in place with that. And so long as processors don't use data for their own purposes, they shouldn't be faced direct obligations with the with the consumer or because they have no direct relationship. So when you talk about third party, I think it's important to distinguish between third parties who have the data for their own purposes and third parties who are processors who are processing under the instructions and pursuant to a contract with the controller. 
That's an important distinction. I totally agree. And, and I agree with that as well. I would note, though, that there are certain obligations that probably should apply to anyone who processes personal information. Yeah. Like security, for example. Security, security. Exactly. exactly. Totally agree there, too. That's, and that's actually a big, big change, I think. I mean, when we started this conversation, security was not naturally part of everyone's lexicon. And I think we've moved more towards a debate, and I think... Senator Cantwell has a, has a lot to, uh, to do with this and, and deserves some credit for it, but bringing security obligations into the conversation about privacy, and I think that's been a really important path forward, too. Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned earlier the handling of consent under that staff draft. Uh, you know, I think exceptions to consent requirements are one of the things that's explicitly bracketed out. It's like, eh, we'll deal with this later. And there are a number of other things. You know, I mean, it, I, I guess what... What was your read on that staff draft? Do you think it's it's sort of a good starting point, or is it basically just articulating first point principles and leaving the hard stuff for later? Well, I, listen, I am not. I'm going to give credit to both the House and the Senate in this. I mean, I think that there has been a tremendous amount of honest effort to get to some kind of solution on this. At this point. I think, candidly, the solution space is fairly well mapped. I mean, we have a number of laws. We have, you know, we've seen a number of big laws in practice for a while. So at this point, we are at a political point, right? We are at a point where we need to figure out what is doable in the United States. What are the going to be the, you know, bright lines? What are people going to be comfortable with? So anytime you put things on paper and you say, hey, this is this is part of the framework, I think that's very positive. Obviously, there were some bracketing that made you laugh, right? Like private right of action in a bracket, except preemption in a bracket. I mean, these are fairly big pieces, so you can't say that we've gotten all the way there. But I took real comfort in listening to both uh, Ms. McMorris-Rogers and also Chairman Wicker in the fact that they were so careful, especially Chairman Wicker, in how he talked about this. I mean, he was very freewheeling, right? He was off the cuff for most of his remarks. He was clearly having a good time, which is always always fun. And then he got to the privacy legislation, and he said, a very important issue to me, one I've spent a lot of sweat equity on, and I'm going to stick to my remarks, which usually to me signals, this is important. I don't want to screw it up with something extemporaneous. I want to make sure that I'm saying what my staff has told me to say at this point in the discussion. So... That's a good, I mean, to me, that's a good thing. That's when things are actually happening. So I think we're at a point now where any, anybody who's willing to put pen to paper on a draft that we can call bipartisan that's getting towards us is, is bringing us to a good place. And I'm certainly not going to criticize them because they haven't solved all the problems yet, though. Obviously, we'll have to before we pass on. Congresswoman Morris Rogers, I think, said this morning that... Uh, Basically, private right of action, she considers a non-starter. You know, she can't get behind that. Um, and preemption looms over all this, right? I mean, I, there's always been some indication that maybe some Democrats um, could live with a bill that preempts state laws as long as it's firm enough. But, you know, we haven't actually gotten any closer to resolving that. So, you know, how do we break through on that stuff? I talked. How, what, how do we what? Uh, you know, wh- where where's the compromise? How yeah. do, how do we actually resolve this stuff that is you know right now bracketed, but really needs to be resolved before we can see legislation that stands a chance? Well, I'm a long time um, consumer person and enforcement person, and was at the Federal Trade Commission working on it, on privacy most of my career, and. While I think the states have made major contributions to the privacy debate, I do not think we achieve our goals in what um, a privacy law is all about and data security law if if you're still going to have, you know, dozens of laws that are inconsistent and that companies need to navigate and consumers need to navigate. Consumers don't know what their rights are. They're different depending on what law is being enforced. So, um, and, and I think there's a deal to be had here. If the law is, the federal law is strong enough, and if the states can enforce it and have a really robust role in, in, in enforcing the law and maybe figure out how they can get the resource they need to enforce the law, because that's a big deal, 
I think the, a deal is there can be a deal on preemption and it would be the right result. Yeah. I would just say I agree with Jessica. Preemption's an outcome. Preemption's an outcome of a strong privacy law such that you feel like there's no need for additional state protection. I'd just like to add a, maybe a little bit of detail because I, I agree with everything that was said. Um, but maybe just talking about what is going on in the states. I think we've heard in um, people uh, as remarks this morning about the tremendous amount of activity going on in the states. But we're already, even without all the new bills that are being considered right now, we are already in a position where we have states like California and Nevada, which used a very similar kind of um, central premise, which is opting out of sale, but ended up with really different definitions of what that means. So we have two states that neighbor each other with people who every day go back and forth. And the idea that their rights are different, depending on which side of that border they're on, is a really bad consumer experience. Um, and then you add complexity on top of that. Um, if, for example, Washington continues its momentum this session and actually passes something that is a comprehensive bill that is more built on the GDPR model than the CCPA model, companies are going to have to figure out how to deal with that when it's not even really comparable to CCPA. Excuse me. And I will say, so I obviously heard what Ms. McMorris Rogers said, and, and I, I've heard her say it a lot. I felt like there was a little softening, though, when we, we had the hearing in December, uh, Chairman Wicker, I felt was slightly more, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he felt more open to a private right of action in some limited context to me. And I think it's important, we're now getting to the brass tacks, right? Private right of action is not all or nothing. It's not like you either can sue everybody for every the tiniest violation of the law or there's no private right of action. You can have private right of action only for serious things. You can have it only in certain contexts. You can give people the right to cure something first before you can sue. You can have a private right of action that doesn't let you get monetary damages. There is a host of different ways that you can have a private right of action to bolster how enforcement happens in the United States. So I just I think we've got a, a lot of potential compromise, and I don't want it to be sort of obscured. The other thing I would say is I think that we've heard a lot of concern about the impact on small business. Certainly Ms. McMorris-Rogers said it. I think regulatory clarity is something that's really important, and I think it's something that we are actually well positioned to deliver in a federal bill because we've had a, conversa a lot of conversations. We can be really clear about what we think the right answers are in federal law so that a small business owner can read the actual read the federal law and say, I have a pretty good idea of what I, I should and should not do here. And if we can get to that level of clarity, obviously we'll need regulatory guidance, but we have an opportunity to really create a level playing field so we're not seeing a circumstance where the only outcome is to hire a privacy lawyer to tell you how to handle your data. And I, I think we can get there, and I think that would go a long way towards breaking some of this impasse. The regulatory clarity Chris is making is extremely important. So um, one thing that was noticeable in some of in the federal bills is that they contained very large, significant exclusions for small businesses. So they had fairly complex regulatory schemes and then just said, well, but small businesses don't need to comply with it. I don't think that's the right approach. I think the right approach is to create more regulatory clarity, is to look at your um, requirements, maybe make some of them scalable. But Small businesses can have a lot of really sensitive data, and they can do a lot of damage if they don't take care of it. And I saw that at the FTC. Many of the enforcement actions against companies with enormous amounts of data, like data processors, financial processors, they had, you know, maybe five, ten people working there because it was all computerized. So, um, so lest, I, lest I think we forget, Cambridge Analytica is a small business. Exactly. So, exactly. So. So I think regulatory clarity is a 
is a, is a very good concept to be thinking about. I, th- I think that that's a very important point, and it relates to the private right of action. Because I think one of the really important concerns about a private right of action is the impact on regulatory clarity. Because a small business is not going to be able to monitor court cases around the country to check to see how various courts Um, and various AGs are interpreting the law. But if you're engaged in, for example, online commerce, you are likely servicing customers all over the country and could potentially be subject to every state's laws. Um, So I, I think, you know, to Chris's point, it's an important discussion to have how to make sure consumers have adequate remedies And there's good enforcement, but at the same time, maintain the regulatory clarity that is needed for small businesses to comply. So on regulatory clarity, you know, CCPA, um, it's pretty explicit, you know, with the criteria of of here's what it takes to have to comply. Um, And it seems like that, you know, there's the 50,000 users, household or devices threshold. I mean, it seems like something like that would capture, for instance, a Cambridge Analytica, even though it's technically a small business. Um, Do you think that that model kind of works? I mean, are you happy with what's in CCPA? Well, um, again, with great um, appreciation for the work that the states have done and the and and the progress we're making here because of CCPA and other mostly C- CCPA. And um, there, first of all, there's all sorts of tricks hidden in the definitions in CCPA. And everyone is interpreting um, the CCPA differently, which is not regulatory clarity. Um, and because the definitions are overly complex and um, interrelating with other things over here. Second, I think the distinction which we talked about before about if it's if it's a first party use of data it's fine um, well not so much but the big distinction between first party and third party that exists in the CCPA you give your consent to the first party and then after that there's no protections I think that is not a um, good model for today's world when so many of the companies that are using your data are behind the scenes. So, um, so again, um, it, it, it's a big step forward to have had California enact the CCPA, but I think it's, it's problematic as a standard moving forward and especially as a national standard. So a few thoughts about CCPA. I mean, we've all talked about the fact that the enactment of CCPA is what's brought us here, although I'll point out that at Workday we endorsed a federal privacy law even in advance of CCPA. But uh, we're on record about that. Um, but, you know, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, CCPA really is a law fundamentally about direct marketing. And it's not comprehensive. It deals with sort of a set of, of concerns, and it does a decent job in sort of regulating those, but it doesn't cover the field. And so I think there are opportunities for improvement. I think there are opportunities to have something at the federal level that's broader that covers things. I think there are important exemptions in CCPA that should be extended to a federal law. So, for example, there's, uh, thanks to the legislature, a carve-out for employee data because you don't interact with your employees the same way you interact with a customer and applying sort of direct marketing rights to employee data doesn't really work. And and even Alistair McTaggart recognized that. Um, so, you know, it's, again, the start of a conversation. We learn from each iteration, and we can develop something then at the federal level that's strong, that provides good protections, that has strong enforcement, that has regulatory clarity. And, and my one comment on regulatory clarity is I think two things have to be true. A federal law has to be specific enough to enunciate the rights. In, in, when we endorsed a federal law at Workday, we said it should reflect all the OECD fair information principles. Those are the principles that underpin GDPR, They were actually developed by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in the Nixon administration when they were getting concerned about computerization. And you've got to have that level of clarity. Just passing something that's vague and saying FTC, figure it out, won't work because then you'll have a case law. And it's worked in antitrust, but we have 100 years of antitrust case law to to draw upon. 
At the same time, it can't be so specific that there isn't room for FTC rulemaking because technology evolves, usages evolve, and you can't sort of have something that then becomes obsolete in five to 10 years. So that's the balance that has to be struck, in my mind, for us to have the regulatory clarity that Chris was talking about. And I, and I will, I'm not going to push back so much, but I do kind of want us to put ourselves, cast ourselves forward 10 years or so, assuming we do pass legislation. I mean, if you look at the laws that govern data today, they're really old. ECPA, 1984, CCPA is the, or I'm sorry, uh, COPPA, the new one, it's 1998. Uh, you know, never mind like the Federal Privacy Act from the 70s. So this lattice work we're going to build will then be, you know, once the lattice is built, the, the flowers will grow around it and the innovation will grow around it. And we will find ways to overcome some of the, the trickier elements to it. If I'm a small business and it applies to me, I suspect there will be a lot of third parties who will step in and say, here is your IT solution to make sure you're compliant with federal law. It's, you know, th- there will be a gap and it will, there will be some bumpy parts. I, I, I will not gonna say there won't be, but I think in a couple of years, we will have overcome those, we'll have found solutions, and then we'll be sort of forward in a place where everyone will know how to handle data. And I think if we do it right, I think if we do it in a way that puts the, the responsibility squarely on the data holders, that gives consumers rights, and that gives them the ability to access their own data, and I think, excitingly, all of those things are really in the proposals, with all the access, we're going to be in a place where we're actually going to unleash a lot of innovation. We're going to unleash a lot of benefit because companies will be able to say, we, we have clear rules. We're ab- abiding by the, raw, the law. Customers will be able to say, I have some comfort because I know that there's an underlying statute. And then they'll be able to use their data in a lot of different ways that I think will be really valuable to them, will be really valuable to customers. So this really is one of those opportunities not to stifle innovation, but to really advance it. And I, and I think that's an exciting place for us to be. Well, um, and on the topic of innovation and also the reference to some laws that are somewhat outdated and need to be updated, that um, brings you to the issue of rulemaking by whoever the regulator is, hopefully the FTC, um, <laughs> not a new agency. We can talk about that. Um, and, um, the, uh, and that's one of those uh, controversial issues, rulemaking. Um, and, and I do want to mention that um, there needs to be rulemaking to make sure that uh, a law like this needs to be updated. But it doesn't, it's not an all or nothing thing. So um, Cantwell's bill has a to, you know, rulemaking for everything, which I think is probably a non-starter for many, um, many companies and industry coalitions. And then other bills, you know, maybe don't have any or they have targeted. Um, I think um, there's a compromise to be had, give the FTC or whoever um, a rulemaking about the things that are needed to evolve, like certain definitions and um, the prohibitions, but um, um, prescribe it a bit, you know, make it targeted rulemaking. The an industry coalition that I just worked with was willing to do rulemaking by adding some criteria to it. So the FTC, it's not, it's APA rulemaking, which is very important. You don't have to jump through too many hoops, but the FTC has to consider additional factors in its rulemaking that create some transparency and accountability around the rulemaking. You know, when you're trying, as Chris knows, to sort of build an architecture that's going to last decades, um, how do you create a narrow rulemaking authority that, you know, it will be able to adapt to the times and to changing technology? By putting criteria around it that need to be considered that both look into um, legitimate, that, that, that are d- designed to allow legitimate business purposes, looking at harm, broadly defined, not a narrow, crimped 1980s view of harm, but a current um, uh, view of harm, um, 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 and, you know, technology and weighing some of those factors without being an overly burdened long list of, of factors. Um, Jessica, you mentioned the idea of a new agency. That seems to be, you know, a little more of a, I won't say fringe position, but, you know, there's broader agreement. Yeah, let's let the FTC do this. And maybe we need to create a Bureau of Privacy or whatever, but they're the right agency. But, you know, the theme here is sticking points. I mean, could that end up becoming a spoiler in some way, even if it's, you know, there isn't 
broad support for a new agency? You know, if there's <laughs> narrow, strong support for it, does that kind of screw up uh, bipartisan legislation? My sense is that it's it's a wish, a dream for certain people, but they uh, and they want it to be part of the conversation in order to keep the pressure on. But that is not going to be a deal breaker. And, and we should recognize, look, the FTC is already internationally recognized as a privacy regulator. They go to the annual meetings of the data protection authorities. They have good relationships with the data protection authorities in Europe and elsewhere. And if we get back to the point that we need to harmonize regimes so multinational businesses can comply across their various geographies, then having a regulator who's respected, who's in those conversations, and who can help design that is, is important. And the FTC is well-placed to do that. And the FTC's authority, um, given what they've created here, and, and I have a vested interest in this, but the FTC's authority is very is much more limited than it needs to be to be a fully effective um, privacy regulator enforcer for the whole country. And they have 50 people working on privacy. So they keep getting beaten up because they do not have the, they were never given the authority they needed. They don't have first time penalty authority, for example. They don't even have jurisdiction over all the companies they need to have jurisdiction over. They don't have the resources they need, et cetera, et cetera. And if we want an effective regulator enforcer, uh, we need to give the FTC more power. That, I mean, that's to me is a salient point. It's just power but in resources, right? I mean, by comparison, the UK, I was talking to the UK um, Privacy Commission a little you know, while ago now, and I was really surprised at how many people she has worked. She has like 500 people working for her. So the, the UK is less, you know, a quarter of the size of the United States. They have 10 times as many people essentially working on privacy at the, at the federal level. Like, that, that's not going to work. And it's not just not going to work for consumers. We've talked a lot about regulatory clarity Another thing that regulators can do is let you know when, you know, you are or not like skating too close to the edge. You could come in and say, you know, we really want to do this. We think it's innovative. We think it's smart. Can you, can you tell us, can you give us a little guidance about whether you think this fit, where you think this fits in a federal privacy model? Well, if you've only got 50 people working in the agency, there's no time for that. There's no space for that. So I think that more resources isn't just give us a bigger stick. It's also let us actually make this a smooth transition and one that's going to benefit the U.S. economy, not just be a roadblock. I would also note one of the big differences between like the ICO in the U.K. and the FTC is that the ICO has had the benefit of enforcing to a clear set of laws. And the FTC, I don't think it's fair to judge at what they will do with a clear federal law um, because they have not had that opportunity yet. Um, and I, I agree that um, giving up the reputation and relationships and expertise that the FTC has developed to create a new agency would probably actually put us further behind than we are now. Um, you know, it's not lost on me that we probably could have had this same panel the same time last year and it would have been three of us were on a panel about this last year <laughs> well so yeah, exactly right i mean it's you know at the start of the current congress there was this strong appetite from both parties you know we got to get this done um there were the same external factors i mean you know ccpa was not in effect yet but it had already passed um gdpr was already you know, going on a year in effect. Um, and we had the same sticking points, it seemed. You know, it's private right of action, it's preemption, and arguably rulemaking. Try, try 20, 25 years, okay? <laughs> I mean, we were talking right before this panel started that to some extent we have been having the same conversation since the late 90s. Um, in, in, in 2000, I was part of a team that recommended privacy legislation to the Congress from the FTC in 2000. And many of the same sticking points are sticking points now, which is why I don't think, um, I do think Congress should be taking the brackets out of its law and making those hard choices if we're really going to make progress. So, so a couple of things. So first of all, welcome, Jessica. Yeah. 
<laughs> Elizabeth, Chris, and I are glad to have you up here. Uh, the, the, the second thing is, I do think there's a difference from last year's conversation. Look at the number of bills, of discussion drafts that are out there. None of those were really in existence last year. They show a lot of commonality over data subject rights. They show a lot of commonality, as I mentioned, about controller processor. They are grappling with PRA and preemption in ways that weren't done last year. So I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress. So yes, it, it's, it's a difficult challenge. There are areas of disagreement. There are areas of discussion. Uh, but this discussion and what we have in front of us in terms of progress is, I think, materially different from a year ago. Well, it's also worth, sorry, it's just worth noting that we're talking about regulating not just the entire U.S. economy or something that touches the entire U.S. economy, but something that many people believe will be one of the key drivers for innovation, economic growth, and a, pretty much everything that we will do in the 21st century will touch on data. So maybe it's going to take just a little while. It's not, you know, what just go past the first thing you think of. We need to take this seriously. I think all the people who are engaged in this process, and there, it's not just the ranking member and chairs of the relevant committees. There's a whole bunch of, of as we say, other proposals that are sort of unrelated, small, are trying to take very serious looks at some of these hard questions, figure out where the lessons we've learned from the states, the lessons we've learned from GDPR. So I take all of that to be very positive progress. Now, if we are here two years from now, so a whole congressional sort of cycle through, and we don't have bills that have passed out of committee, we don't have hopefully bills that have passed the House or the Senate, then I will say I will probably be singing a different tune. But I think the amount of deliberation has been appropriate, and I, I hope that we're getting to a point where we are going to start to see some deadlocks get broken. I would just know one of the things that is also different from last year is that when we did this panel at that point, we were anticipating the impact that CCPA would have. Uh, we didn't know exactly what implementation would look like. We didn't know what the 8G would do with the regulations. Um, we didn't know what other states would choose to do, whether it's following California's path or um, doubling down on their own or, uh, as is often the case, picking specific issues and choosing to do one narrow thing over doing comprehensive legislation. But I think we're sitting here today with a lot more knowledge about how CCPA actually works. And so we can do a informed comparison of the protections it gives to consumers against the federal drafts that we now have to look at. And the fact that we have federal drafts, we have language, I think that momentum from the end of the year, getting those drafts out in people's hands to be able to have the public discussion about how we get this right is a really substantial piece of progress. And I think it will continue because people understand that what is happening with the patchwork in the states really does necessitate some federal action to ensure that not just consumers in California or Nevada have privacy rights, but that all consumers in the U.S. have privacy rights. One observation I would make from my decades in privacy is that um, the, uh, while there were bills back when, and there's been so much discussion about whether to pass a privacy law over the years, um, the debate has shifted towards consumers. So if you look at what, you know, at the Republican bills, you know, I mean, it's not completely a partisan issue. They are so much more um, pro-consumer and in the consumer camp than they were 20 years ago where there were sort of, there were consumer bills on the Democrat side and there were, you know, business bills. Um, now the debate has really shifted because of California, because of GDPR, and you see things in bills on both sides that are fairly progressive and positive for consumers. And I don't know whether that's good or bad for some of the people in the audience. I think there was probably a much better deal to be had from business um, 10 years ago, and they missed an opportunity and will now have a har harder bills to comply, harder, harder laws to comply with if one passes. 
it, it does seem like, you know, even if, say, Washington, Colorado, whoever else moves quickly and passes a big CCPA style or GDPR style or whatever um, privacy law, I mean, it, it, there's still going to be, okay, then it has to be enacted and then it has to go into effect. I mean, it seems like we're still maybe a couple of years out realistically from actually confronting that patchwork and what that means. So, you know, I mean, do you think that there is that sense of urgency when it's just looming? I think there is a sense of urgency. I mean, I'm certainly hearing it from lots of people. Um, I also think that there's a careful sort of inflection point, right? I mean, once you start to have a lot of state laws, if I'm a representative from California, I have to pay very close attention to the laws that have been passed in my state that my consumers presumably are happy about. In other words, I don't want to pass something that's weaker than the state law. I don't want to be taking rights away. So you have to kind of have a careful point. And I think people are aware that, like, we really don't want to be in a position where legislators from 20 different states are having to contend with whether they're, in fact, going to undercut an existing state law. I think it's actually really important that we hop on that you know, we start to deal with that now. And I do think that, to to echo a little bit uh, Jessica's point, that we are seeing more consumer, we're seeing bills that, and and within concepts that were viewed as very pro-consumer only a couple of years ago, becoming much more mainstream. And I, I frankly think that's not just because we have state laws, but because these issues have become much more salient to individuals. They understand that, they may be served an ad that may actually give them a different experience about a a for-profit college or a more expensive credit card rate based on data that's collected about them. They understand that, you know, technologies that worry them like face recognition may be enabled by the use of data, may be enabled by things like collection of information about their face, for example, that they didn't agree to. So, as the issues become more salient, people talk about them, they talk about them with their lawmakers, and the lawmakers come back to Washington and say, gosh, this is a thing we need to do something about. And I'm hoping we're getting to that point. We won't know until, you know, when we start seeing some things get passed out of committees and, and passed out of the House and the Senate, then we'll really be on to something. But it feels like that to me. Um, I want to save some time for questions, but I guess my last question uh, what realistically do you think is the timeline for, you know, actually getting something through both chambers of Congress, assuming that that can indeed happen? Listen, I, I mean, I always laugh at this. I always say my crystal ball is broken, right? It doesn't. But I, I, could, I could imagine us getting closer to some kind of consensus in if we could get bills out of both committees in this Congress, both the Senate and the House committees, that to me would be a pretty substantial step forward. I think typically, historically, after a presidential election, that first year is typically a very fertile period for lawmaking. I'm not telling anybody in this room anything they don't know, but it feels like that's the window we should be shooting for, right, is let's get some kind of consensus in this Congress. Let's figure out the edges of what we want and then we can use that lawmaking window in 2021 to really make something happen. I think that would be my hope. Maybe it's optimistic. I'll just weigh in. I, I do not have a solid prognostication on when, um, but I would just note, I think it's been raised before, that the drafts we're looking at right now really do have more in common than they do in terms of differences. And I think that provides a lot of hope that um, by focusing on how to bridge those gaps, we can get to the place where there's a solution that's acceptable to everyone. Um, So I'm feeling more optimistic than I have in a while. um, And I'm hopeful that uh, Congress will continue to feel the urgency around this issue. All right. Well, we have about 10 minutes. So, yeah, let's open it up for questions. Someone. Uh, thanks for the panel, Carl Zabo with NetChoice. So one of the easiest things to do is call for laws when they don't affect you, 
And one of the things that Chairman Wicker's bill did, which I haven't seen much elsewhere, even in CCPA, is it applies to all data collectors, kind of like how GDPR does. So whether you're a 501c or sorry, 501 or 503c6, uh, 503c4, whether you're nonprofit, for profit, anybody who collects data should be covered. And that that doesn't apply in CCPA. It doesn't apply in the Cantwell bill. And a lot of the people calling for private right of action are typically not covered by the piece of legislation. So for the purposes of the panel, do you think that any bill that moves forward, whether at the state level or federal level, should cover all data collectors, kind of like GDPR does? And does that change the way that you feel about private right of action and statutory damages if it also impacts nonprofits as well? I'll start. Yes. Sorry. Yes to it should apply to everybody. No, it doesn't change how we feel about private right of action. We'd actually like to get that one right for everybody. Ditto. For the reasons I said before, um, there should be, the law should be right. It should be something everyone can comply with. Even small entities, for example, can um, do a lot of damage if they don't protect the data. So yes, it should apply to everybody. And regardless of whether you support a private right of action, um, it should be the same result. If, like us, you believe that privacy is a fundamental right, then your right shouldn't depend on the nature of the entity that is processing your data. I wasn't going to answer this question because IA is a nonprofit, but we're not calling for a private right of action. Mm -hmm. But, um, yes, everyone should be covered. Hi. Uh, Danny Weitzner, uh, good to see you all. Uh, I want to ask you a question that you, several of you kind of alluded to, but didn't really elaborate on. Um, And it's really about what happens beyond consent. Uh, Jason said, well, uh, you know, sometimes consent gets in the way of processing that's important. Chris said, and I agree with, uh, consent often puts um, totally unreasonable burden on on individuals. uh, and I want to ask you about what is beyond consent. Chris, I think you said use limits. Um, what's interesting to me is that the GDPR, I think, has a kind of a clear answer to this question, which is legitimate interest. It's, it's the idea that a, a data collector, a data controller, can process data beyond um, consent or other authorizations if it states what it thinks is a legitimate reason. It kind of takes on the burden of that actually being found to be legitimate. It's not unlike what the, the, the respect for context idea that we had in 2012. So I, I'm, I'm curious about what you think. Does, 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 privacy, does federal privacy legislation get through just by winking at the consent problem and saying, yeah, well, we know it's all messed up, but we're just going to go with that anyway because that's what everyone does? Or, or do you think there's a way to actually grapple with, with this question in a serious way? So I'll start. I do think there's a way to grapple this serious way, and I think GDPR has grappled with this serious way, and this is something GDPR got right. Look, if you are a business, aside from consent, which is your only real basis for direct marketing, there tend to be three things you rely on. There are others in the list, but these are the three you mainly rely on. Necessary for a performance of a contract. If you buy something from me, I need to be able to ship it to you. Necessary uh, to comply with a legal obligation. I have certain things where I have to process your data because I'm obligated by the government to do certain things. And as you point out, legitimate interests of the controller that are not outraged by the rights of the data subject. And I think that is the right balancing test. It puts the burden on the controller, as Chris has been talking about, to have to justify its data collection, to not have to like put the burden on the consumer to accept or reject, and to be able to stand by that justification in the case of enforcement. And so from our perspective, I think we'd really like to see those types of bases built into a federal law. So uh, thank you, Danny. You've given me a chance to talk about something I love to talk about, former CDT. Um, So we, I I loved it. Thank you. I didn't plant that question. Um, So we might take it, first of all, I agree with everything that Jason just said, but we might take it a slightly different way. And, and one idea that we've put forward, and we actually drafted a, a draft privacy bill that does this, would, would be to pick sensitive categories of information and allow those to be collected for the purpose that, the, that of providing a particular service that the consumer understands. So 
if I am in the sense of categories, it would be things like biometrics, location, uh, kids information, health information, but take location. If I am using a map app, I understand that I need location. Right? That's every consumer. That, to me, is the truest form of consent. I am using a service that requires this, and I understand it. CDT thinks that it would be a really good idea in those sensitive categories to stop there and say, you cannot use that location for anything else. You can use it to maybe to improve the service that you want to offer, but you can't share it out. You can't sell it. It literally stops right there. And we think those kind of red lines would give consumers a lot of confidence that they could, for example, offer up their biometric without worrying that it's going to end up in a big database. I think that there are ways we can do that. I think that gives us a lot of the innovation benefit without, without, hindering, um, you know, without hindering consumers' rights or making them feel like they're being undercut. So that would be my take on that. Um, Danny, I haven't seen a consent-based bill that doesn't have extensive exceptions for all those uses that would constitute legitimate interest. They're often very detailed and they're spelled out. And there's some benefit to that because I've heard some horrifying um, interpretations of what legitimate interests are in, in the GDPR. So I think if there's going to be a consent-based bill, which would not be what I would, a, a heavily consent-based bill, which would not be what I would favor, there's not going to be a problem with having exceptions for all sorts of legitimate uses like, like compliance, et cetera, that, um, that, that need to be permitted absent consent. But another approach is to take uh, it is to develop a pill that is that is more about use limitations, um, and to say you can't in, you, you can't engage in these terrible practices. You can't you can't um, um, you can't you you know buy data um, from a data broker and use it for eligibility determinations. You can't um, if you in, if you use data or sell data to anyone that enga- that engages in fraud. It's prohibited. You can't, you can't sell data for stalking, you know, all sorts of things. You can come up with a pretty long list and then you give, also give the FTC some robust rulemaking to expand on that, to make sure it keeps pace with technology. And then it's not so much a consent-based model that regulate, that says you have to get consent for every use. And now you've got to exclude all the legitimate uses. It's, it's a use-based model. Okay, I think we maybe have time for one more question. Thank you. I'm Adam Eisgrau with the Association for Computing Machinery, which despite its funny name has nothing to do with computing machines per se. Uh, We are the largest, oldest association of individuals involved in computing, and we don't lobby. We have no agenda other than to provide technology assistance to policymakers. Um, We have seen in an encryption debate that I expect we'll get to uh, in not too long that there is... Uh, at least a difference of opinion, if not a difference in the understanding gap between what can actually be done in that context with and without technology to solve that policy problem. We've seen in the Cambridge Analytica hearings, quite famously at this point, that there's a bit of a technology gap uh, between and among members. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wicker and Ms. Cantwell, of course, and their staffs are now quite expert in technology related to privacy. My question to the panel is, uh, entirely self-interested but in the public interest, what can and should organizations like ours that are populated by the real experts in this stuff, we hand out the Turing Award, we know computing, uh, and there are other organizations similarly capable, where is still, if there is one, the most pressing need in the privacy context to close that information gap and what's the best way to do it? Well, I'll just say that I think, I mean, I think there's, having People understand how the technology works tends to be valuable in tech policy policymaking. Um, so there's always that there's always an education role. I would say very concretely, we're seeing a tremendous innovations in how information is being processed in a privacy protective way. So homomorphic encryption, um, you know, ed- using artificial intelligence, using information from artificial intelligence in a way that can elucidate insight without violating people's privacy. There's been a lot of work there. I think we're getting closer to being able to make those commercially available technologies. So I would say that allowing policymakers to understand where we can actually have it both ways, where we can gather this data, 
but we can do it in a privacy protective way that's not going to harm innovation would be, to me, very valuable. I think also hearing about the impact on people who are operating as small operators, individuals, um, I think the more of those types of voices that Congress hears, this question about small business and the impact on small business becomes more educated. And I think hearing directly from people who will be impacted by a federal law is really useful. I think evaluating some of the main arguments that uh, certain factions make, you know, sometimes the deciders are not very sophisticated and they get comments in and they say, you know, we can't do this any other way, et cetera. And I think um, helping to evaluate those arguments to make sure they're um, accurate and not misleading would be very helpful. All right. Let's leave it there. Um, you guys have about 10 minutes, and then Brewster Kale will be, I believe, in this room to speak. Um, but thank you to the panel. Thank you.